make sure I'm on. All right, I'm on. Okay. It's good to be with you all. Uh, it was just beautiful to reminisce uh, from my perspective on being able to join you all this morning here at Cornerstone. Like uh, Tim said, the roots go very, very deep with this body. Um, Tim and I have been friends since the playground of elementary school uh, out in California where Tim and I were bitter rivals in every sport. He was a year older than me and he had his crew and I had my crew and we would just battle at recess every day and it's really all I could think about all through elementary school and we we grew up to become dear friends. Uh, I moved out to Florida uh, long before he did, then his family followed as well and then we we're both married, and Tim and Brooke and us, we lived in the same neighborhood as newlyweds, and, and I worked with Brooke, and uh, um, then I went on to uh, work at the same company that Darren and Dallas work at, and I worked for them, and, and I uh, grew up with Hillary. I don't know if you guys know this, but Hillary, Dallas Trahern's wife, is, is my first cousin, so she's my cousin, so I've known her my whole life, and, and if you're wondering, you know, this is a guy that's different from Darren coming to preach to you today, yes, Darren is, though, speaking through me in many ways because he discipled me for many years. He and I were roommates living in my parents' house for a while when I was uh, not walking with the Lord, and Darren was like this gospel influence on me in those years. And now, going from being roommates and coworkers and, and brothers and then having him pour into me over coffee at 6 a.m. for so many years, it's sweet now to see that He's here in Houston, Texas as well, and we get to minister alongside each other to the same city. And uh, I just want to give you guys greetings from Founders Baptist Church. Uh, I want to greet you guys from the congregation there who's constantly asking about you, constantly tuning into your live stream, constantly trying to see if we can uh, connect with you in some way. I know them, I, I hear often of people saying, oh, you know, we're, we're going to go visit the church plant because we want to see how it's doing. Um, and I also want to say greetings from uh, maybe what I would say is perhaps the longest standing prayer warrior for this church, which is Pastor Richard Caldwell, who has been praying for this congregation right here for something like 12 years. He's been longing to see a church planted in this part of town and has had it on his heart to see it happen. And he is, cares deeply about how you're doing and asks constantly about you. And, uh, and also just the sweetness of being able to watch as he's been praying for this congregation for all these years, but he knew that he needed the right man. He knew that he needed the right man and the timing wasn't right and the Lord orchestrated all that together so that we could all come and, and see this church planted this year. And it's just, it's just beautiful, is it not? It's beautiful. So with that, I know that Darren would want me to do nothing else than to open the word of God. So if you'll turn with me in your copy of the Bible to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2. I've titled this sermon, How to Make Your Pastor Rejoice. I usually don't like titling sermons. I'm really, really bad at it, but this one just fit. And so uh, what we're going to do this morning is look at unity from the book of Philippians, specifically in and around the fact that your pastor's not here today. But if you want to know how to make your pastor rejoice, we're going to be able to see how to encourage his heart even when he is away. So I'm going to read from verse 1. It says, if there, oh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, I actually, I prepared my sermon this week in the ESV. And I just realized you guys are, are doing this from the NASB, which I love dearly. And so I'm going to read, I'll read this in the NASB. I stole my brother's NASB so I can read it in the NASB. But if I reference the ESV today, I apologize in advance. All right, let's begin verse one. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look, o- look out for your own in- personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Let's just pray really quickly and ask the Lord to bless our time. Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit's power to, to come upon our hearts this morning and help me to transmit these truths accurately and faithfully. 
and help our hearts to be softened by what you might teach us this morning, that we might live according to it. In your name I pray, amen. amen. <clears throat> so as I was looking this week at this text, I just kind of spanned back over my time here in Texas and, and my time talking with Darren about what's going on in our culture and what's going on in the world, what's going on even in evangelicalism. And when you, uh, if you make the mistake perhaps of getting on Twitter, you see what's going on. It is just like the, the riots of, of last summer or two summers ago have continued into the online forum and they just never stop. There is just a constant bickering and quarreling going on all around us. And whether people are rioting in person, when they finally stop rioting in person, they go and they sit down and they riot through their thumbs. As all around us in this country, we have people set on their own desires, wanting their own ambitions to be met, and complaining and arguing and just thrashing anyone else who holds a differing opinion. You might call this generation the quarreling generation. Yes, quarrels have been going on since Genesis, right? Since Genesis chapter 2, there's been quarrels and arguments and fights, but but I can't think of a generation that just looks at quarreling as more of a pastime than our generation. It's like, oh, I'm going to go relax, get on my phone, and quarrel with some people, it seems. This is the quarreling generation. I mean, before, before the, the advent of, of technology and putting phones in our hands that allow us to do this, you had arguments with your siblings. My, my brother's here today. He can tell you we had plenty of them. You had arguments with your, your elementary school rivals, Tim. We had, we had arguments. You might have had arguments with your parents or maybe with some coworkers or, or maybe your teacher, your classmates. But this generation, this generation has been given access through technology and, and given permission, so to speak, to, to quarrel with anyone and everyone about anything all the time. And so really this generation has created disunity in every aspect of our lives, everywhere we go. And it has crept into the church. It has crept into the church. Personally, I think the, the resurrection or the reformation of, of sound doctrine in America has been a wonderful thing. It has had a wonderful impact on churches like this one that are committed to a biblical ecclesiology and biblical soteriology and biblical doctrines that will not allow for error to creep into the church. And that's an encouraging thing, but, but that doesn't avoid the potential threat against the church of quarreling members. Disunity within a church, even one with sound doctrine. We all know James chapter 4 says, what causes quarrels and fights among you, is it not this, that, that your passions are at war within you? You're des you desire and you do not have, so what do you do? You murder and you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. My brother and I used to fight over who got to sit in what chair at the breakfast table every morning. And man, it has been hard the last couple of months because my, my sons themselves have found their favorite chair at the breakfast table. And man, that thing is worth a lot. Or, at least, or so you would think by how father's sins passed down to their children and now my boys are arguing over the same chair that my brother and I used to argue over. It's tragic. It's tragic. And so, in the context of what Paul is writing to the Philippian church, he wants to write to them about a threat that is coming against this healthy church body. Paul wrote to all sorts of churches that he had helped plant and that he had a shepherding role in, but not many of them were as healthy as the Philippian church. They were serving, they were meeting needs, they were holding to sound doctrines. There wasn't a lot of, of false teaching or immorality throughout the church. But one thing that they struggled with, despite the health of their local body, was quarreling. And so at the end of chapter 1, verse 27, Paul wants to give them some commands, some imperatives that they need to live out. And he summarizes it under this one large command 
through which everything else that follows from that is going to kind of be meeting that, that one overarching category. And he says in verse 127, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so upon finishing and completing this, this imperative, which would require them to, to be able to help them endure persecution, right? Any threats that might come upon them or any discouragement they might be facing, they need to just focus on this one thing. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. And so in continuing this idea into chapter 2, Paul is going to stress the importance of spiritual unity and its gospel benefits. And, and to, today we're going to look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, under three headings. Three headings. And, and verse 1, I'll give them to you from, from the outset. Verse 1 is going to be the motivation to pursue unity. Verse 2 is going to give us the mentality to produce unity. And verse 3 and 4 is going to give us the method to preserve unity. So let's begin with verse 1, the motivation to pursue unity. And he starts by giving this strange writing structure. He starts by not making his point, but building this, this foundation through which he's about to make a point. To bring it into a seminarian language, we would call these conditional clauses, right? Conditional clauses. But what that really just means is that you guys would understand it like this. They're if-then statements, right? If-then statements. We all under, understand an if-then statement. If this is true, then we must do that. And he begins with these four conditional statements. Now, what's interesting about these conditional statements is that these are not the kind of conditional statements that we're confused about whether or not they're true or not. These are the kind of conditional statements like, uh, brother in Christ, if you love God, which I assume you do, then do this. So it's a bit rhetorical, but the way he's phrasing it has a purpose. But all of these conditions are actually assumed to be true. He says, if there is any encouragement in Christ... Any comfort from love, or, or your translation might say consolation of love, if there's any fellowship in the Spirit, if any affection and compassion. These, are, these four conditions are aspects of the experience that a, every Christian should have in the life of Christ. Every Christian should be able to read this in the church at Philippi and understand that, oh, I can relate a little bit to each and every single one of those experiences. So it might even be helpful to, if you read it like this. Since you have encouragement in Christ, since you have consolation from love, and since you have this fellowship of the Spirit or affection and sympathy, since you have those things, I'm going to exhort you. Now to, to expound a little bit upon each of these conditions, I want to just dive in a little bit and explain them a little bit. So he says encouragement in Christ, encouragement in Christ, to be comforted in having Christ. So let's do this by asking some questions. Christian, have you ever tasted of the encouragement of the Lord? Has he, has he ever shown you his kindness in forgiving your sin? Has he comforted your soul when your soul was cast down and he offered you encouragement? Has this comfort helped you see that, that you, your sin has been removed from you as far as the east is to the west? Does it comfort you that in Christ you have an advocate for when you sin? When life is at its darkest, when illness, pain, and death torment our families, has the hope of eternal inheritance been an encouragement to you? So those are some of the benefits that we have through the encouragement of Christ, but also he's not just talking about you specifically and your personal relationship to Christ, all of this is in context of the local church body, the people that are in this room or any church that you've ever been a part of. And so we also have to ask the question, have I felt encouragement in Christ personally, but also have I realized the experience and the reality that there is encouragement that happens through the body of Christ to one another? Have I ever experienced, which I assume you have, that you have at one time in your life, if you've been a part of the body of Christ, the local church, felt encouragement in an area where you were discouraged? Have you ever been lifted up by someone's words or someone's caring or someone's letter or someone's message or someone just giving you a hug on a Sunday morning? Have you ever just received someone that says, hey, I'm praying for you? 
Have you felt the encouragement of knowing that the Lord has put it on someone else's heart to pray on behalf of your discouragement? So we have this individually, but also within the body of Christ, this this encouragement that he talks about. Additionally, he says we have a consolation of love. This is the idea of the the root word being to, to be consoled. Have you been consoled through the love of God and through your fellow believers in the church? When you thought there was no hope and you assumed that God would judge you for all eternity from your sins and perhaps you even tried to self-atone for your sin with your meager good works before Christ. But deep down you knew that it would never be enough and you were downtrodden because of the burden and weight of your sin. Did you consider the love that spilt blood on your behalf Did you consider the nails that were meant for you but given to Christ? Did you consider the love that it took to give up everything? And like we read about this morning, come down to earth on behalf of sinners who would crucify him to save them. And then have you considered how you've been consoled through the body of Christ in regards to your losses and through the love of those around you? And so he says, if you have consolation of love, which he assumes you've experienced in some way, shape, or form in your life, if you're truly a believer. Then he says, in the fellowship of the Spirit, if you have fellowship of the Spirit, this is the fellowship that we have in the body. If you've enjoyed that fellowship of being a part of a local context, a local church, if you've enjoyed that fellowship, and that fellowship is rooted in, and it permeates through each and every one of us, in, through this power of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. Why is it that you and I, though we have never maybe met each other, though we grew up different, why is it that we have this inner love for one another that we can't quite explain? It's because of the, the fellowship that we've been given through the power of the Holy Spirit when he came in to dwell inside of you at your regeneration. And if you've experienced this fellowship, the kind of fellowship that helps you realize that this person that I just met, who is a fellow believer, this person that I just met, who grew up in a different country, different city, different culture, they never had, they never got the whole Texas thing, right? They don't even know what queso is when they get here. Why is it that I know them and have more in common with them than the kid I went to high school with? It's because of the fellowship that we have in the Spirit. And if you've enjoyed that in any way, shape, or form, and been ministered to in the fellowship of the body of Christ, then these upcoming imperatives are for you. And then he finishes with any affection or compassion. This is the idea of of the feelings that come from deep down in our inner um, organs. In, In the original Greek, it would be like something coming from our deep down in our gut, the affection and the love and the compassion that we might have for somebody else. If you've experienced that affection that you have for other people, for when you see other people in the body of Christ hurting, you hurt. And when you see other people in the body of Christ broken, you're broken for them. And if you felt the affection of the Lord for you, in your sinful condition, and when you've been picked up by Christ after falling yet again in sin, and you felt the affection and deep abiding compassion, that inner craving to love and be loved by God, if you've enjoyed all of that, then what's coming is for you. I just want to pause real quick and just say that I titled this sermon, How to Make Your Pastor Rejoice. But before we dive into the exhortation that gives us the how-to, the prerequisite for this passage, the prerequisite for this passage to apply to you, and the prerequisite for you to be able to make your pastor rejoice, is that he actually has to be your pastor. And what makes him your pastor Because there are churches all over America that come into church every Sunday morning and they sit in the pew and maybe they serve and they sing and they do all those things, but they don't have a pastor because they're not truly in Christ. They don't have a pastor who's shepherding their soul because they are not a part of the family of Christ. And so from a gospel perspective, I want to just say at the outset 
before we examine how to make our pastor rejoice, we need to make sure that he's our pastor. And it, the only way to make him your pastor is to make Christ your Lord. To make Christ the Lord over your heart. And now I assume that if you're here today, you're here because Christ is your Lord and because Darren is your pastor. But if you're anything like me and spent 20 years in sound churches that have perfect biblical doctrine and rejected it with your morality and rejected it with your life and never had any true abiding fellowship with the body, never experienced any of these conditions because I was dead in my trespasses and sins but acting the part in healthy churches. Darren saw through that in me. And he called me out on it when I was in college. And I'll, I thank him to this day. But we have to make sure that Christ is our Lord before we can have our pastor be our pastor. And then, then we have the ability, if we're a part of the family of God, because we've repented of our sins and trusted in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, now we've been adopted into the family so that we can experience these conditions that he laid out for us in verse 1. And if we've experienced those conditions... Let's do this. He's given us the motivation, right? Let's, let's look at the mentality that it takes to produce unity. And he starts that mentality with one major overarching verb of this entire section of verses 1 through 5. That one main overarching command is do this. Complete my joy or make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. That's why this sermon is titled How to Make Your Pastor Rejoice. Now, I don't say that because the ultimate end of every single one of us should be to, to make Darren happy. Darren does not care about being happy. He cares about you all being holy. That is his motivation. Not to just be encouraged because, oh, okay, but to know that you guys are growing in Christ. And so he says, complete my joy. And how would we do that? How would we complete the joy of our shepherds and our pastors? By being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord and of one mind. So what is the, the actual source of our unity? Is it, is it the clothes that we wear? Is it the, the translation of the Bible that we carry around? Is it the houses we live in? What makes us unified? The seedbed of Christian unity starts in the mind and in the heart. It doesn't start at the action level. It starts in the mind and the heart. And Paul knows this. Paul knows that it has to take root in your heart and soul first before it will, take, before it will actually be true fellowship in the body at an action level. This can't be skipped over lightly because many throughout history have strived for unity and practice without ever treating the mind and the heart. They might serve in their church and care for one another but they have not shared the same mentality in the same mind. They, had, they were both serving actively in the church, two people, but they had competing motivations for doing it. They had competing directions for where the church might be going. They had competing convictions, and they had competing prizes at the end that they were searching for. And so there was no true unity to be had, ultimately. The longer they serve together, those competing affections and competing desires will drive them apart, even though they're both actively serving in the body. So Paul knows this. We've got to unify our minds and our hearts first. Then when we serve each other, we're moving in the same direction. And so in order to create the kind of lasting unity that that you cannot, simply, you cannot simply jump to practice. We have to start at the seedbed, at the root, at the heart and the mind. The same biblical convictions, the same mission, the same purpose, the same doctrines. And that's why he says being of the same mind. Think, think the same things is how this would translate in the Greek. Just think the same. Discerning God's will through the grid of scripture, fighting for the same doctrine, seeking to live godly lives according to the same truths, teaching those same truths to our children, and spreading the same gospel throughout our community so that we're unified in truth, we're unified in purpose, and then we can finally be unified in our service. He's just having the same love. This is, this is saying, love one another. Love one another. The pastor's joy is made complete when he knows you're thinking alike and you're loving one another. That's going to require you forgiving those who sinned against you because Christ forgave your sin. Sacrificing your time, your talents, your resources 
to serve the church and its people because Christ sacrificed his seat next to the Father coming down on earth to become a man to serve us. <clears throat> we have to be unified in our spirit. This is to be harmonious, to walk side by side in the church in the growth of Christ. Hebrews 10, 24 is a great verse that I quote a lot of times to my students where, where it just encourages us to think about one another. It says, what are we here for? Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds. We have to consider constantly in the body, how can I encourage and stir up my brothers and sisters through my life and through my words and through my example of serving in the church, how can I help them to be more godly than they were last week? More holy than we were last month. Having that same purpose of one mind. This goes deeper than just the actions or even deeper than just doctrines. This goes, this goes deeper than being a Calvinist or being pre-trib or post-trib or, or whatever. It, it goes beyond any of that. It's to have the same life purpose. A lot of Christians have different life purposes. Some of them have a gospel ministry purpose. Some of them have a, I want to build an empire in, in the career, but then also be a Christian purpose. Some of them are, I want to build a mega church purpose. But remember, remember back in chapter one, Paul gave us the purpose. He gave us the purpose and we have to hold to this purpose above all. He said, and this could be said of Pastor Darren to you this morning. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's the purpose. And then if you continue that verse, he really gives the perspective of a shepherd to his sheep where he says, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent as your pastor is today, that I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for faith of the gospel. So why does my pastor rejoice when, when the body of Christ is unified? It's because there's, is it just because there's less quarreling and less arguments that we have to put out? No, not just because of that. It's because their unity is, is fulfilling the obedience to this larger command of living your life in a manner worthy of the gospel. Every pastor carries this burden each day. Are my sheep being fed? Are my sheep wandering off? Are my sheep hearing the right voices? And are they living worthy of the gospel? Paul's saying, look, I'm in prison. I'm writing to you from prison. I've got, I don't know what's going to happen with my life, if it's going to be taken from me or not. But I take joy anyway because there's so much gospel ministry going on. But one thing could really, really discourage me. One thing could really, really wreck me as I'm writing from prison. Right? I'm going to be joyful in Christ, to live as Christ, to die as gain, no matter what. But what would really discourage me is to know that you guys are quarreling. To know that you are not unified in everything that you do. And he knows how big a task this is to be united in their thinking, purpose, doctrine, and so on. And so he goes on in, in verses 3 and 4 to dive into a bit more specifics on this matter. He says, okay, I've given you the, how, the kind of mentality that you have to have to be truly unified. I've given you the motivation that should, that should drive you toward unity, all of the blessings that you've experienced in the body of Christ. So now you've got the, the motivation, the mentality. Now here, here's the method, our third heading, the method to preserve this unity that you have through the Holy Spirit. He drives straight to the, the uncurable sickness of man, this selfish ambition that is lying within each and every single one of us. The first sin ever committed was born out of what? Selfish ambition. Did God really say, right, in the garden, did God really say that you're going to die if you eat of that tree? And Eve thought, you know, yeah, maybe God isn't good in what he said. Maybe he wasn't telling me the truth. Maybe I will be better off and mm. Also, that fruit looks desirable to me. I want. And so he goes right to that root sin, the first sin ever committed. Doubting God's character and desiring our own selfish ends. And nothing's changed in the, in the thousands of years since, has it? The source of quarreling amongst us is still that selfish desire that is, is ripping through our entire globe right now. 
So what's the church to do? What do we say about the sickness of the world? Paul thought we, we have the antidote in Christ if we go to work killing our selfish ambition and pride. If we go to work living in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now, <clears throat> I think he goes after unity because healthy churches and churches like this one, there's not going to be some doctrinal error that's going to just jump out of nowhere and take Darren and the elders of this church that God raises up and the leaders of this church by storm and you guys are going to be off in some massive error. I know your pastor. He's poured into my life. It's not going to happen. So how, how does Satan attack something in pure and good and sound as a, as a new church plant that's following a biblical ecclesiology, a biblical philosophy of ministry? How does Satan thwart a church like that? With some massive error coming out of left field? No, no. He does it by, by allowing you to grow proud and selfish while you think that you've really got it going on. So he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Make no mistake, perfect, uh, Satan is perfectly fine with having you sit under rich, sound, pure doctrine, so long as, so long as you live with selfish ambition and pride in your heart. He likes if you've got great soteriology, those of you that really love to read theology or have really been craving for a sound doctrine church for years out here in Katy. And one finally comes and you're like, aha, I found it. He's perfectly fine for you to sit here and be under sound doctrine if it's going to puff you up. Because you'll render your, your service to Christ is useless if you grow proud in it. You might be thinking, this is a, this is a new church and, and man, it's growing fast. right? And if I play my cards right, I might be able to boast that, that I was one of the people who built this church. I might be able to become a, a deacon or an elder of influence here. I might become a, a respected teacher in this church. Or perhaps I'll be influential in children's ministry, women's ministry, youth ministry. Maybe people will raise up my family as the shining example of how to raise your kids right. Maybe I'll be the one that everyone comes to for advice. <clears throat> Maybe I'll be the, the man that shows other men what it looks like to be successful as a Christian man in this culture. What if the Philippian church had heard of the other moral and doctrinal problems that were happening in other churches that Paul planted? What if, what if they had heard that this church was having a, a moral scandal in it that Paul planted? And this church was falling off into asceticism and mysticism. And they thought, man, us at Philippi, we're pretty healthy. We're not falling into that stuff. We're pretty good. We've got it going on. What would happen? What would happen to their fruitfulness and to their living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? You see, guys, this is what I want to distill it down to. The greatest church on earth, the reason it's the greatest church on earth, it's because it has no idea that it's the greatest church. The greatest church on earth, the secret to it being that is that it never figures it out. It never stops to think, hey, are we the best church ever? Do we finally fix all the problems from all the other churches we've been involved with? And we all got together and said, how can we fix all the problems that all the other churches had and do it right? And then we're going to be the greatest church. No, because the greatest church on earth at this time, this day and age, is too busy living in a manner worthy of the gospel. Too busy killing sin. Too busy loving Christ, serving one another, sharing the gospel, practicing the one another's, to ever stop and think, are we the ones that finally figured it out? Is this the church that's finally got it going on and is going to do it right? The moment you think, yup, compared to everyone else, our church is booming. We made it. We cracked the code, so to speak. At that point, you've ceased to be useful to the Lord. You've exposed your, your conceit, your pride, and your selfish ambition. And what's more, you, you begin to think your church is amazing, but also even more so, you start to think that you're pretty amazing. You start to think, uh, you know, this church has really an opportunity for me to gain my own influence and to puff myself up. And Paul knows this, so he continues by saying, not just 
not just kill your pride and, and your conceit, but also in humility, count one another. Count others as more significant than yourselves. So Paul says, you want to be unified? You have to rid yourself of pride. You have to not seek your own interests in the church and in other relationships. Do not push for your own way. How many of the ministries in this church, it's like, kind of like raising a child. You finally figure out how to run and, and handle your, your, your newborn schedule. And what happens? A week later, they shift their whole schedule. And you finally figure out how, if you give them just these things, and you, you put them to bed at just this time with this blankie and this little teddy bear, then they finally go to sleep and we, we cracked the code. And then two weeks later, they shift. Well, a church plant like this is the same way. Just when you guys think you've, you've administrated this thing really, really tight and figured it out, the church gets an influx of growth or an influx of, of, of exiters of the church. People who leave the church and suddenly everything changes and now we're back to square one and we're trying to figure it out. And if we're after our own interests and we're not considering others, we're not going to defer to one another. We're going to say, I think we should do it this way. I think we should do it that way. But we have to be a church that defers to one another. I might have a good idea, but it might not be best for our church to follow it. It might be best and most loving to my fellow believers to say, you know what, that person, this is a new ministry that they're running, but you know what, they're giving it their absolute heart. They're giving it everything they got. They're sacrificing their time, their, their efforts, just out of thankfulness to the Lord. So I could go in and say, well, I know a better way. But is that what love would do in the body? No, love just wants to help the body be more holy and the rest of it's all figured out. It all gets done. We have to count others more significant than ourselves. Thinking about everyone else's wants, <clears throat> Darren and I share the same mentor. We spent many years under him, and there's this common statement that, that we would often hear whenever we get selfish and whenever we get proud and whenever we get self-consumed about what we want. And this mentor would say to us, you know what you need to do? And I'm, I'm wondering how many of you have already heard this from Darren. You need to get lost in the needs of others. Have you ever heard Darren say that? You need to get lost in the needs of others. And what he's saying is don't think of yourself as, oh, woe is me, I'm such a terrible person. But rather this, just don't think of yourself because you're too busy serving other people. You're too busy meeting the needs of fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that have been starving or have been hurting or are going through trials and pain. Count others more significant than yourselves. So what's the consequence of a church that neglects this type of humility? What's at stake? I mean, we could dive into a myriad of scriptural texts about what God says about his relationship to pride. I'll read a couple really quick, but Proverbs 8 says that God hates it. God hates pride. So if we're a church that gets puffed up and seeks our own way, God's going to hate what we're trying to do. Proverbs 15 says the Lord brings calamity, instability, insecurity to the proud. We've seen that happen in the culture and in the church. Proverbs 16, the proud heart are an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 16, 18, pride ends in destruction and stumbling. We have to be a church that kills pride so that we can preserve unity. Not only consider others more important than ourselves, but verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Like I said, it doesn't mean that you don't think well of yourself or don't take care of yourself at all because you're so busy serving everyone else that you're not even getting meals and not even getting clothes and taking care of your own home. It just means get your mind off of you whenever you can. There are way too many people in trials that we can pray for in this church. There are way too many spiritual tools that you need to be added, adding to your tool belt. There is way too much sanctification that needs to happen in a body like this. Women, there's way too many families to support and serve. Young mothers to support and serve. There's too many people needing to be brought into the core from the fringes. And you ladies are so good at just wrapping your arms around newcomers and bringing them into the core. There's way too much work to be done there. Men, there's way too many gaps in all of our leadership, is there not? There's way too much inconsistency in how we lead our families at home. There's way too many leadership convictions that need to be built so that we can train up the next generation that's coming up in the church. There's a lot at stake and we have too much to do. We don't want to be a church that's rendered unuseful to the Lord. 
So if you've seen in your life and in your heart a pattern of discord, a pattern of quarreling, maybe it's even at other churches. Maybe you're here today because you were in a quarrel at another church. Maybe you thought that quarrel was worth dividing over. Maybe you, maybe you didn't understand whether it was, maybe you can't even remember what it was about. But that's what brought you here. If we don't want to be rendered useless to the Lord, we have to be a church that's putting off quarreling by thinking others are more important than ourselves, looking after others' interests, being unified in purpose and mission. <clears throat> Perhaps you've been quarreling, well, maybe one of two reasons. Maybe you've experienced that quarreling for one of two reasons. You've, you've been quarreling because you've not yet tasted of the conditions that we mentioned at the beginning of the sermon. Maybe you've not tasted the sweetness of the Lord. Maybe you've not felt the love of Christ and from your brothers and sisters. Maybe you're not in Christ and that's why you've never tasted these things and that's why you quarrel. And we need to examine that. We need to examine, are we truly in Christ? But, but maybe it's not just that. Maybe you quarrel because even though you've experienced the blessings of being in Christ, you've forgotten how much you've received from Christ that you did not deserve. And so we have to go back and repent of that. If Christ Jesus has done anything for you, then we need to stop exalting ourselves over others. If you've received salvation and you've been lifted in your spirit by the encouragement and wisdom of God's words, and if you've been loved by Christ and by your fellow, by your fellow believers, and if you've received the Holy Spirit to help you and minister to you in the body, then let that be your motivation as to why you ought to practice humility. And you might say, well, this person betrayed me early on in this church. This person hurt me deeply, and I have some wounds and some scars that haven't quite healed. Maybe these people, when I came to this church, maybe they didn't reach out to me as much as I thought they should. Maybe they didn't welcome me as much as I thought they should. Nobody invited me to lunch, after all. Well, maybe you think it's hard to love the hard cases, but maybe you are a hard case. <laughs> and in fact, in Christ, all of us are hard cases. Raise your hand if you're a hard case. I'm a hard case. Because if we don't love the hard cases, it's going to hurt our gospel witness. John 13, 35 says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you what? If you love one another. So not only will this church be rendered useless in the growth in the body currently, if it grows proud, it will be rendered useless in its gospel ministry to those who are unbelievers. People might not know that we're actually of Christ. Conversely, if we don't love one another and we're not unified, they will either not know that you're a disciple of Christ, or worse, they will think less of Christ because of having watched your poor testimony. And this, room doesn't, this verse does not leave room for apathy. It's not just put up with one another, right? It's not just put up with the hard cases and, and don't mind their presence in the church, but actually seek to love the hard cases just like we are hard cases. So why should we do all this? The benefits that we've enjoyed in verse 1, the imperatives and the calling that we've been given in verses 2 through 4, but also... We need to remember the example that we read about earlier and he talks about in verse 5. Look ahead to verse 5. It says, have this attitude in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Earlier in the service, we read about the humiliation of Christ and how he left behind his status, his comforts, his home, his preferences, and he lowered himself to serve the hardest cases. He lowered himself to save the most lost among us, to love the most stubborn and unlovable, to help the most weak. He came to adopt us into his eternal family, and now he's teaching us how to function for all eternity in a heavenly family. We're, this is just a trial run where we're learning how to do what we're going to do in heaven. This is him, our preparation for heaven. If you're going to go on a cruise, they're going to give you a safety briefing. They're going to tell you how to conduct yourself. They're going to do all these things. This is our safety briefing for how to conduct ourselves in heaven. And that's actually a very important theme in the book of Philippians. Because the Philippian church, really quickly, the Philippian church, they had the very rare status of being a Roman colony. 
This would be like if, if you got treated like an American citizen on the other side of the earth, right, the other side of the globe, but you had all the rights, privileges, status, everything that came with being an American citizen in another part of the country. That'd be pretty privileged, would it not? Now, this church is in modern-day Turkey. So imagine getting, uh, dressing like the Romans dress, talking like the Romans talk, being under Roman law, having Roman rights and privileges, while living far away in Turkey. That was a very coveted status in their day and age. And so they took very much pride in being citizens of Rome. In fact, the trump card in any of their arguments in the marketplace, somebody mistreating them, excuse me, do you not realize I'm a citizen of Rome? I'm from a Roman colony. There would have been some status to that. But Paul in this book, we don't have time to look at it today, but Paul in this book is saying, you're no longer Roman citizens. You're citizens of heaven. Your citizenship is now in heaven, which from it we await our Savior to take us home. So he's saying all of this is walking in a manner worthy of the gospel. It's just your, your prep for heaven. You're you're taking off of your Roman clothing and your Roman cultural stuff and putting on your Christianity like a robe, preparing yourself for heaven. And that's what we have to do. Because we have to ask ourselves, what could be more worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? What could be a better testimony of walking worthy of, of the gospel of Christ than to do the exact same thing that Christ did. What is the gospel? It's good news. Good news about what? About Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Jesus loved us. I mean, this is ABC stuff for our kids in in Sunday school, right? Gospel, good news. Good news, Christ. Christ loved us. What's more worthy of the gospel than loving the same people that Christ loved enough to save them? There is literally nothing more Christ-like you can do than to just show love for one another. And if this church is going to stand the test of time, whether it grows or whether it shrinks, is all in God's hands. Faithfulness to unity in the gospel, faithfulness to love one another is how this church will be judged. It is not by size, it is not by programs, it is not by by anything else than the, the, the godliness of the people within it and their faithfulness to love one another and hold to sound truths and to live them out in their lives. If you look at the pattern of the church throughout for the last 2,000 years, no church has ever become, been a faithful church and stayed that way for hundreds and hundreds of years. You ever thought about that? No faithful church, biblical church. Let's take like, uh, if you go to John Calvin's church today, it's not people sitting there in the pew every week holding to the same truths that Calvin taught. No, it's empty. If you go to, to Spurgeon's church, is it the same church that it was, just a looking a little bit different with a little bit of microphones now that they didn't have back then, but they're still holding to the same doctrines? No. Because every church that has been faithful, God raises up for a time, then he scatters those faithful sheep to go do the same elsewhere, and then usually what he does is he closes down the faithfulness of that church. So this church has its time. And I think that that's by by God's design and his wisdom, because if there was a church that had been like faithfully doing the right thing for 500 years, would we not all crusade like it's Mecca? Would we not all go to it and be like bow down at that church that, that, that has been faithful for 500 years and say, ah, they've been doing it right? No, we, we would get distracted by that and God just knows us too well. He just knows us too well. So he says, I'm gonna raise them up and I'm gonna shut them down. And so while this church is up for however long the Lord decides until he scatters all of us to other churches and shuts this one down, we pray that it lasts as long as he would desire And we pray that it lasts for generations to come. But the history is on the side of it finally falling into error. But we have to remain useful by not being proud, by being committed to the same purpose, the same mission, and all of us just gathering together to affect the city of Houston, one of the largest cities in the United States, by being faithful to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, specifically through being unified. May we all live up to that high calling together, both churches, founders, 
and Cornerstone and however many more the Lord wants to plant here. Let's pray.